This is Fothentic History. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Brian Young. And I'm Holly Fry. Holly, yeah. you want to talk about some wands today? I really do, because it's not something I have a lot of expertise in, and so I can always benefit from expanding my knowledge. Um, so let's do that. Yeah, and it's it's interesting too. There's a lot more science to it than uh, there's as much science to it as magic, which I found interesting when I was when I was going through this. I agree. Let's shall we jump right in? Indeed. So, like we said, we're going to talk about wands today and wand lore. Wand lore is an ancient and complex branch of magic that deals with the history, creation, and, for lack of a better word, science behind the construction and use of wands in the wizarding world. They're used to cast spells and perform many tasks in the wizarding world, and although there are some traditions of witch and wizarding that don't use wands, they're fairly ubiquitous. And there are many different factors in wand making that affect the use of a wand, and we're going to speak to each of those in turn throughout this episode. They include wand length, the material from which the core comes from, and the wood from which they're crafted. But first, we're going to talk a little bit about those who craft the wands and the history of their use. So wands in the wizarding world originated sometime before the common era, though the exact point at which they were brought into magical use is in dispute. We do know that the Ollivander family first began making wands in the British Isles in 382 BCE and soon grew a worldwide reputation for wands. And we'll talk more about them later. The first wands being manufactured in North America were in the 17th century by the Irish witch Isolt Sayre, and wand makers only began working in Africa in the 20th century. Because of laws in the wizarding world to keep magic hidden from muggles and no mages, use of wands differs from country to country. In European tradition, school children were given wands upon arrival at school and could carry them with them wherever they went. At Ilvermorny, the only wizarding school in North America, students received wands at school and then had to leave them there during their times away from the school until they reached their 17th birthday. And part of this owed to the more hidden nature of magic in North America, which uh, kind of stemmed from the panic of situations like the Salem Witch Trials. And by the 1920s, wand use had become common in North America, but the Magical Congress of the United States, or MACUSA as it's known, insisted that every wizard and witch, native-born or even traveling through, obtained a, uh, a wand permit. Wands are peculiar in that they're quasi-sentient. They have minds of their own, and they actually choose their owner. And using the wand of someone else can actually have really serious side effects. The ability of a wand is also affected by its condition. A wand that is broken or cracked will also have a hard time doing what a magical person requests of it. Wands are, are used through specific sets of flourishes and incantations to evoke specific spells. Wand history and technique are taught in, the, in most wizarding schools. Uh, swish and flick is a common refrain from wand teachers around the English-speaking world when teaching spells like Wingardium Liviosa. There are a few fundamental laws of wands that are universal throughout the wizarding world. The first is, as we kind of hinted a moment ago, that a wand chooses its owner, and it will form a bond with them. The second fundamental law is that the relationship between a wand and its owner will grow in complexity. The wand will learn from the owner, and the owner will learn from the wand. The third law states that the wizard may channel magical energy with any wand, but it is with their own wand that their magic will be strongest, and the best results come from wands that are alike in the personality and temperament of their wielder. The last fundamental law is that a wand may be won from its owner, and only then will its allegiance bend to its new master. Wands, though, usually stay loyal to their original masters, which means that simply disarming a wizard might not be enough to sway the allegiance of a wand away from its original owner. The only exception to that is the Elder Wand, and we're going to talk more about that in uh, a little bit more specificity just in just a bit. 
So wands can also be passed down by generations. Uh, Neville Longbottom inherited his father's wand. Ron Weasley inherited a wand from his older brother, though doubts remain if a witch or wizard who acquires a wand in this way will ever be able to fully master it. One of the most revered wand makers in modern times is Garrick Ollivander, who comes from a long line of wand makers who, as we said earlier, began their tradition in 385 BCE. He was born on September 25th, and details differ about the specific year, although he do, we do know that he was born in either 1907 or a year just prior to that. His surname, Ollivander, is of Mediterranean origin and means he who owns the olive wand, which suggests that his family had emigrated from the Mediterranean region to London when they opened up the first iteration of their famous shop. Garrick Ollivander inherited this family business and came to be renowned as the best wand maker in the world. He actually revolutionized the way that wands were made. Prior to his advancement in the crafts, witches and wizards would find some magical substance that they liked, and they would graft it into the core of their already existing wand. But Ollivander felt that this altered the temperament of a wand and created a subpar product. He began to switch the way it worked, so he went out and found a variety of magical substances to be used in the cores of wands and found complementary woods to craft around them. And then wizards and witches would arrive at his shop and have the wands speak to them, and they would know that they had been paired with exactly the correct wand. His exact method of marrying wand cores and woods into the right lengths and then matching them to the right recipient was a closely guarded secret that rival wand makers wanted to know, but many believe it just came down to the unique magical abilities inherent in Ollivander himself. In 1938, he matched a powerful wand that was 13 and a half inches long, made of yew with a phoenix feather core, to a young wizard named Tom Riddle. The phoenix feather for the core was obtained from Fox, a phoenix in the care of Albus Dumbledore. Fox provided only one other feather for use as a wand core to Ollivander, and it found its way into a wand that was 11 inches long and made of holly. The twin of Tom Riddle's wand would remain in Ollivander's shop until 1991 when it was paired with Harry Potter, the boy who'd actually survived a killing curse from Tom Riddle's wand. These twin wands were the reason that Ollivander was kidnapped by Death Eaters in 1996 and tortured for information about them, as well as information about the Elder Wand. He escaped later, and he gave similar information that he had revealed to the Death Eaters to Harry Potter in his quest to defeat the Death Eaters once and for all. Now we're going to talk about Grigorovich, who is perhaps the second most famous wand maker in the Wizarding World, um, and his name his name was Mikey Grigorovich. He was raised in Eastern Europe, and his wand shop, opened first in 1945 in a German-speaking country, was known as Grigorovich Zauberstabe, which translates to Grigorovich Wands. He did sell wands in London, though, in Carket Market, in a shop called Wands by Grigorovich, and was a direct competitor of Ollivander's. Grigorovich and Ollivander had different ideas about wand making, and Ollivander found his rival's work to be lesser in his eyes, although the wands that Grigorovich made functioned perfectly well. It was believed that one of the last wands that Grigorovich made and sold before his retirement was to the Quidditch star Victor Crumb. Though Grigorovich was a competent wand maker, though second rate compared to Ollivander, his place in the history of wand lore is secured less by his wand making and more by the fact that he was the master of the Elder Wand for quite some time. He worked hard to replicate the power of the legendary wand, but before he could do so, the wand was stolen by Gellert Grindelwald sometime in the early 20th century. It was this information that Voldemort sought when he tortured Grigorovich and killed him. We're going to talk again more about the Elder Wand later, but first we're going to examine the different roots of wand lengths, cores, and wood. So first, um, for notes on different sorts of wands, uh, we're going to turn to the work and journals of Garrick Ollivander, who wrote at length on the subject. And for many wand makers, there was a tendency to match the length of a wand to the height of its owner. Uh, the taller the wizard, the longer the wand. But Ollivander found this measure to be crude, writing quote, uh, that it fails... Uh, 
writing that it, quote, fails to take into account many other important considerations. In my experience, longer wands might suit taller wizards, but they tend to be drawn toward bigger personalities and those of a more spacious and dramatic style of magic. Neater wands favor more elegant and refined spell casting. However, no single aspect of wand composition should be considered in isolation of all the others. And the type of wood, the core and the flexibility may either counterbalance or enhance the attributes of the wand's length. According to Ollivander, most wands range between nine and 14 inches, though exceptions to that range have been known to happen, but are really quite rare. Physical peculiarities tended to require longer wands, while he wrote, quote, abnormally short wands usually select those in whose character something is lacking, rather than because they are physically undersized. Many small witches and wizards are chosen by longer wands. The other aspect of wand length is the flexibility of the wand. Ollivander states that wand flexibility or rigidity denotes the degree of adaptability and willingness to change possessed uh, by the wand and owner pair, although again, this factor ought not to be considered separately from the wand wood, core, and length, nor of the owner's life experience and style of magic, all of which will combine to make the wand in question unique. The next thing to consider is the core of the wand. There are many magical substances that can be used in the core of a wand, ranging from kelpie and vela hair to kniesel whiskers and dittany stalks. But Ollivander narrowed down wand cores to the three most powerful cores, and he limited his use to those. And those were dragon heartstring, phoenix feather, and unicorn tail hair. We'll talk a little bit about the properties of these three wand cores, but... I, I want people to realize that the wands are really the sum of all their parts, and these are generalizations based just on these aspects. Pair one with a specific sort of wood in a different length, and it might counterbalance some of these properties drastically. So wand making is incredibly complex, and we don't want to make you feel like we're op oversimplifying it. Unicorn tail hairs make very loyal and reliable wands, and they are incredibly resistant to perform magic in the dark arts. But they're not the most powerful of wands, though the choice of wood and the length of the wand can compensate for that to some degree. It's also said that they're prone to melancholy if they're misused, and they can actually die and need replacing because of that. Conversely, dragon heartstring cord wands have an easier time turning to the dark arts, but tend to make the most powerful wands. They'll also switch allegiance to their current owner quickly. They learn spells with speed, but are more, the most prone to accidents and have a reputation for being temperamental. Phoenix feathers are the rarest type of core that Ollivander traded in. They have the broadest range of magic that they're capable of, and they tend to be pickier when it comes to choosing their owner. According to Ollivander, quote, they show the most initiative, sometimes acting of their own accord, a quality that many witches and wizards dislike. These wands are the hardest to tame and personalize, and their allegiance is usually hard won. Now, switching to wand wood... There are many sorts of wand woods that can be used to craft a wand, and we won't get into all of them, but we'll talk about a few that are important for you to know about and what their properties are. And like humans, magic is only found in a small percentage of the population of trees. Ollivander wrote on Wandwood in his notes, quote, It takes years of experience to tell which trees have the gift, although the job is made easier if bow truckles are found nesting in the leaves, as they never inhabit mundane trees. He then goes on to add the caveat that his notes on Wandwood should, quote, be regarded very much as a starting point, for this is the study of a lifetime, and I continue to learn with every wand I make and match. Harry Potter's wand is made of holly, and holly is said to be a fairly rare wood for wands. Wands made of holly tend to be protective in nature and choose wizards who need to overcome character flaws like anger and are often embarking on an important or spiritual quest. Ollivander noted that pairing holly with phoenix feathers, Harry Potter's wand was, is something next to impossible, but when it happens and finds its ideal match, it might be unstoppable. As an aside, I'm so glad that that particular segment fell to you because saying my own name over and over in that context would feel very strange. 
<laughs> uh, Ollivander's own wand was made of hornbeam, and he claimed that hornbeam wands often chose wizards of singular obsession. They adapt quickly to their owner's style of magic, and they become so personalized to their owner that another witch or wizard attempting to use a hornbeam wand that has been broken in will find even the simplest of spells really difficult, if not impossible. Victor Crumb also carried a wand crafted of hornbeam. Hermione Granger carried a wand made of vine, which was a wand wood favored by ancient druids. Though not technically wood, the druids considered anything with a woody stem a tree. They're a less common sort of wand that, that tend to choose wizards and witches who seek greater purpose. Ollivander said that they can emit magical effects on their own when their intended pair simply walks into the room, and that was a phenomenon that he personally witnessed twice in his shop at least. Yew wands are rare, but often choose unusual or notorious individuals. Two of the most famous wielders of yew wands are Tom Riddle and Ginny Weasley. It's interesting that the mortal enemy and wife of Harry Potter both had similar wands. Yew wands have dark reputations, and they are adept at dueling and curses. It's said that when a wizard wielding a yew wand is buried with it, the wand grows into a new tree that guards the grave of its owner. As for other woods, it's said that willow wands have healing power, walnut wands are often wielded by inventive or innovative wizards and witches, hawthorn wands are contradictory and complex and are as adept with healing magic as they are curses. Wands made of pine find themselves in the hands of independent-minded wizards and witches and adapt easily to new techniques and spells. Sycamore makes wands that yearn for excitement and if they grow they and they grow dull if the tasks they're used for are mundane. And of course, we could not do an episode on wand lore without delving into the most notorious and powerful wand of all, one of the Deathly Hollows, the Elder Wand, which we have referenced a couple times already. It was believed to have been created by death itself and, dis- and bestowed upon Antioch Peverell as payment for a bounty. Peverell asked for the most powerful wand in the history of wizard kind, and death obliged. It went by many names over the years, including the Wand of Destiny and the Death Stick. The wand itself was created in the 13th century and made of elder wood. It was 15 inches long and had a thestral hair core. The elder wand was capable of performing feats of magic that would have been impossible for even the most powerful wizards in normal circumstances. It was unique in that it was a carved wand with elderberry-like clusters up and down its length. Albus Dumbledore, the headmaster of Hogwarts, who was killed in 1997 by Severus Snape, believed that Peveril actually created the wand himself. After killing another wizard in a duel, Peveril drunkenly boasted about the power of the wand, and another powerful wizard killed him and took it. The Elder Wand was notoriously ambivalent to its owner and respected only strength. So if you beat the previous owner in a duel, the Elder Wand bent to your will without much of a problem. I like how easy it is for it to just jump ship. Like, oh, you're good. We're gonna. I don't think we're... I would want that wand. <laughs> no. So this wand passed through the ages until Mikey Grigorovich, as we said earlier, got a hold of it at some point and had it stolen by Gellert Grindelwald. With the wand in his possession, Grindelwald raised an army and began a reign of terror through Europe and threw those who opposed him into a prison of his own creation called Nurmengard. In 1945, Grindelwald was goaded into a final confrontation with Albus Dumbledore and lost. Dumbledore took possession of the Elder Wand and exiled his former friend into his own prison of Nurmengard. This whole story could be many, many episodes, and we're sort of glossing over it at the moment just to trace the chain of title of the Elder Wand, but uh, it is a safe bet to look for more episodes about this stuff sometime in the future. Voldemort uh, scoured the earth looking for the Elder Wand, torturing Ollivander, killing Grigorovich, and even tracking down Grindelwald himself. It was said that Grindelwald, from his prison cell, refused to answer any of Voldemort's questions about the Elder Wand, and he was killed in a final act of defiance, many believed to be an act of hopeful atonement for his crimes earlier in the century. Dumbledore lost possession of the Elder Wand at the time of his death to Severus Snape and Draco Malfoy in that same year. They didn't know that Dumbledore's wand was the Elder Wand, and he was buried with it. Voldemort robbed Dumbledore's grave to get at the wand, but didn't realize that he was not the master of it until it was too late. 
He ordered Snape killed, but di- that didn't confer ownership to him. And since Harry Potter had bested Draco Malfoy, who's the true owner of the wand, Potter became its true master. Because Harry Potter was the Elder Wand's true master, Voldemort's killing curse that he cast with the Elder Wand backfired against Potter's Expelliarmus spell and ended up ending his life once and for all. At least until Delphina, Voldemort's daughter with Bellatrix Lestrange, got her hands on a time turner. But again, that is a long and different story. And that's what we have now about wands and wand lore in the wizarding world. Um, you know, wands wands are really fascinating, and it's uh, it's interesting that the the combinations of how you can put a wand together plus the personality of the person who's wielding it can yield such different results in every situation. It's no wonder people study it. Uh, for their entire lives. Yeah, I mean, there are so many different permutations possible with each individual wand, just depending on who walks in a shop that might be chosen by it, that it's really, really a massive undertaking to try to study this. Yeah, yeah, no, and and, and like uh, like Ollivander said, you know, you, you learn something every time you pair a new wand with a witch or a wizard. Indeed. Uh, Do you have any listener mail for us to learn from? I do. Well, not to learn from. It's just sort of a a nice email from a listener named Daniel. Uh, Daniel uh, writes, Hi, my name is Daniel. Big listener of Authentic History and love your show. I go to Ilvermorny and I'm I'm in Thunderbird and it scared me so much when it beat its wings because it's just a carving and I didn't realize it was enchanted. But anyway, I was just telling you I love your show and want no mages that listen to know about Ilvermorny because all you hear is Hogwarts. This Hogwarts this, Hogwarts that. So please tell the no mages about Ilvermorny and Macusa. Thank you, Daniel. Daniel. P.S. Don't tell anyone, but Ilvermorny is on Mount Greylock in Massachusetts. Um, I'm not going to edit that out. But uh, hopefully this episode, I, I made sure because of this letter, I want you to know, I made sure that we included the history of wands and Macusa uh, in this episode with, with Ilver, and in Ilver Morney just because, uh, you know, you wanted to know about it. Yeah, I think that's Thank fair. you for saying nice things about us. Oh, so much. Thank you. It's always appreciated. Um, so that's it. Where can people find you, Holly? Uh, I'm lurking on Twitter <laughs> as Surliest Girl. Uh, I'm on Instagram as SurlyGirly5. I said that weird. I'm on Instagram as Surly Girly Five. Uh, I also have my regular day job podcast, which is Stuff You Missed in History Class, which you can find at MissedInHistory.com, and all of our correlated social media jumps off from there, but is Missed in History pretty much everywhere. And then I do another project with you. Yeah, uh, we do the Full of Sith podcast together, and uh, you should give it a listen. It's a lot of fun. Uh, you can find it at fullofsith.com. Uh, as for me, you can find me on Twitter at Swankmatron, and uh, that'll lead you to everywhere else you can find me and all my writing. And uh, as far as Fothentic History, you can go to fothentichistory.com and leave us a leave us a message there on our contact form. Uh, we really love to hear from you. You can find us at Fothentics on Twitter. You can find us uh, at Fothentic History on Facebook and, and wherever else. And... Uh, yeah we'd love to if you could wherever you listen to the show give us a review that would be swell well until next time then